I want to welcome you to our team group. They are really excited to hear about you and, and your journey. And they have prepared some questions for you. So let's get started. Okay. Um, so one of my questions, so we had an introduction from um, Chrissy yesterday about like you are um, an American football player. And especially when we looked at your website, which I thought was really cool. So one of my questions was, how did you get the opportunity to be featured in the game? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. So I've actually been in two games, believe it or not. Um, I have several Minecraft worlds. There's a series of three different Minecraft worlds called Coach Gen. Um, and they include like touchdown battle and different things like that. So that was um, actually a group called Toya, which is an all female development crew out of Israel. They were doing Minecraft worlds and they wanted them to all be based on strong female protagonists because half of gamers are girls. And yet there are very few games where girls can be the hero of their own story. So the group from Toya heard about my football camps and they reached out and asked if I would be interested in having a series surrounding, you know, those camps. And for me, that was, first of all, absolutely yes, because it's cool, but it's also so important for us to be able to have representation, right? Like that you could see that this was something that was not only okay, but it was actually pretty cool because having done girls camps across the country, one of the biggest challenges has been um, getting girls to believe that they could play football, especially back then, because that was a few years ago. Um, and so it was really interesting to me too, to hear that the same challenges we were having in football were those that they were having in gaming. So it was kind of a cool opportunity to like see the world of sports meet like esports, right? And how those things could work together to create more opportunities and representation. So from those games, I actually got introduced to um, some of the folks at Madden and there's two guys. One was the producer, his name was Robin Cowie and the director um, was Mike Young. And they do story mode in Madden. So in story mode, it's all characters, right? And you actually, even though you see it as a video game, um, you actually have to um, have actors do all of those things so that they can record them. Um, and it's really weird. They put all these dots on your face um, so that the computer can pick up on them. And then it could make my face do things that I did not do when we were recording it. So they can make it make all kinds of crazy faces. They can spin your head around. It's really kind of bizarre, but they record all of it with the dots on your face. And then they have the motion dots all over you. If you've ever seen like the motion capture suits, which is what they call it. They call it mocap. Um, so when I met those guys, um, I was, we were talking about Toya and what they had done. And then they were asking me questions about football. And I actually was just teaching them some football things um, in the way that I teach them because um, the game Madden struggles in two categories um, relative to some of the other games like FIFA and NBA 2K. And that's um, internationally and with women. And I said, well, a lot of that is the approachability of football, right? If you didn't get to play, it's already a really complex game. And we've not done a, a great job making um, American football, so not soccer, uh, global. And so, you know, I was talking to them about how they could make some of these things more approachable and how I've taught um, football to people who had not played before. And I was teaching them zone coverages with slices of pizza um, and teaching them how, you know, you could find the soft spot in the zone, right? Because that'd be where the pizza breaks were. So if I have a cover three, man, it's in between the two pizzas. We call them the seams, right? If it's cover two, right? And you have two safeties, where do you think the soft spot is? Down the middle, right? And if you have cover one, it would be like one big slice of pizza, meaning that 
the targets are then on the outsides. And I was literally taking through them with this with pizza. And then the guys kind of look at each other and they're like, are you thinking what I'm thinking? You know, it was like one of those magic moments. And they had a character in story mode, who's a reporter who, as they said, they're like, she's kind of the anti-reporter though. She knows way too much about football. So she kind of has a little bit of an attitude and pushes against people. And they're like, you could play her, couldn't you? And I was like, ooh, talk about football. Hmm, I don't know. And they were like, yeah, see, that's her. And so I actually got cast as the reporter in story mode first. And so I'm in the game as that reporter um, and they were all really excited. And then they hired me to consult for Madden. And it was interesting because the more people I got to know, the more they were like, you know, we think it's really cool that you're in the game, but you're not playing yourself. And so they were kind of like, you know, we did a cool thing, but we, didn't, we weren't as cool as we could have been as if we actually had you in there. And then they came back to me and said, you know, we have an idea. Would you want to be the first female head coach in Madden in superstar KO mode? So, and they already had all of, you know, my face. So they just really had to repurpose the stuff that they had already captured and to make that happen. So um, it was really, it was really kind of a fun process. And so if you go in Madden 20, and I think it's the same in 21, um, not only am I a reporter, but I'm also a coach. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. So, and it was so much fun, like getting to film, like, you know, and go through that motion capture process and, and, you know, the acting part of it, because when I was y'all's age, um, I actually wasn't sure if I wanted to be an athlete or an actress. And so I tell people now I get to do some of both. That's amazing. Incredible. Incredible. And I'll tell you something, if you watch it, it's really funny. Um, and you could pull up the clip. It's on my Instagram if you've ever gone on it. But one of the things that my players thought was really funny is either team shutdown is the shortest team on the planet or they made me super tall because in the huddle, I'm the same height as all the guys. <laughs> yeah. And I told them that you're like, you're five foot two. And mm -hmm. so we were talking about that yesterday about, and even for me, like, I'm like, my gosh, you know, and you playing football, American football with all of those guys. And I just remember vividly as I was listening to your story, like your, your, your biography or your autobiography. Um, and when you're playing with all those guys and then putting into account that you're, you're so small, like you're so strong physically, but you're so you're tiny. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. It's amazing. And yet a lot of people, when they meet me, um, they'll kind of say, you know, you kind of look like that coach, but, um, she's a lot bigger than you. <laughs> and I laugh. I'm like, oh yeah, really? Is she? Okay. Um, but it happens all the time because in people's minds, I'm really big. Um, mm -hmm. so they're always surprised when they see me and I'm, and I'm smaller. Um, but I don't think the video game helps because what they do in that, in that situation is they have different scenes, right? And they basically just, you know, change out like the face. So it's not like I acted out those scenes and we had actual guys like that is just a matter of, you know, they basically put my face on a different frame. And so what they didn't account for was the height. And so um, that's always something that's funny because that probably contributes to why people think I'm really small because no one would, no one would expect that my team of players would all be like, you know, five foot two. Right. Um, so my question was, why did you become an, uh, a football player? You know, um, so I grew up in Vero Beach, Florida, and football is just the sport. It's like everybody goes and watches high school football. Um, there's not a college team that's really close. And the NFL teams um, that are closest are all about three or four hours away. So it's funny because uh, where Vero is, it's directly across the state of Florida from Tampa. 
Okay, so we're on the East Coast, Tampa's on the West Coast. We're three hours north of Miami. So Miami is down south. And then Jacksonville is like, I think four hours north. So it wasn't like there was a close team that everybody would go watch. So high school football really was like the big thing. And I remember watching it and looking out on the field and I thought the guys looked like real life superheroes, right? They had like the pads and the helmets on and the lights were so bright in the stadium. It just looked like the coolest place to be. And I just wanted to be one of them. And it was actually the first place in the world that somebody really said like, you know, oh, girls don't do that. And it never really made sense to me, but it wasn't like I was, you know, I have to play and I'm going to change this. It just wasn't an opportunity. So when I got the opportunity to play and believe it or not, I actually played rugby first because it was the closest I had ever seen to football. So when I went to college, I'd never seen football or um, rugby. It wasn't big in Florida, but when I went to Boston College up in the Northeast, it's much more popular. And when I saw rugby, I was like, this game is amazing. It's like soccer meets football, but they get to tackle. And so I played rugby for all four years at Boston College. Um, did get recruited for the under 23 national team. Um, and then I think they figured out how small I was. <laughs> so I did not make the under 23 national team. Um, and then after that, I went to playing football. But one of the reasons why I became um, as good as I did is I think because I played rugby first and I learned how to tackle with no pads and no helmet. And so um, was a rugby style tackler before they started realizing that football players should do that too. You know, when you're not, when you're not taught that the helmet makes you invincible, you're a lot more conscious of where your head placement is. And when you tackle with no helmet, you're sure not going to put your face places. It, it shouldn't go. And I think that's, um, one of the reasons why I was such a good football player is because once I added pads and a helmet, I wasn't going to change what I already knew worked, but I was going to, you know, obviously have another layer of pr protection. And I teach lots of people how to tackle. Um, I actually taught Tyreek Hill how to tackle um, a couple of weeks ago because, you know, he's on offense and he doesn't do that. Um, but I was teaching it out of camp. And um, I taught everybody with no pads and no helmet. Um, and my joke to all the guys was that if I can do this and not mess up my makeup, then you know that my face is in all the right places. And I did, and I had makeup on and it was the same at the end of the day because your head doesn't have to be in there. I love that. Um, yeah, so it's sort of like a two in one. So, um, obviously, like how you said, like, if you, uh, you're like very the small person on the team, would you say that drove you uh, to perform better? And also, like, along your journey, what would you say are some of the things that kept you going? So, I think it makes you um, have to be competitive um, in everything you do when you're undersized, right? Like, I would say, you know, I wasn't going to out big anybody. So, you know, if you look at let's use Shaq as an example, right? When he played basketball, he could just be big, right? And everybody had to work to try to get to his level or to try to compete with him. That was never going to happen with me that I could just show up and be big, right? It's not possible. So that means every time I'm out there, right? Whether it's, you know, um, at practice or making a play or in a drill, I have to go hard or I'm automatically going to be at a disadvantage. And I used to tell people all the time, my teammates and even people I was competing against that, you know, um, if I don't give you my best, you should be insulted because it means you're not worth it right? Like, because I, I don't think you can handle my best. And I was notorious for, you know, literally going hard all the time um, on all drills. And that was something that, you know, um, some people loved about me and other people, maybe not at times, right? Because it pushes them too. 
Um, and what were the things that kept me going? Um, you know, it was tough, definitely, um, it, at times. And yet the thing that I always thought about is that they would call football the final frontier for women in sports. And so for me, that was like a challenge. If this is the final frontier, then when we can win here, can't we do anything, right? Like if we can play this game and do it the right way, then aren't we pretty much, you know, gonna be able to not only change the sport, but to change culture through the sport. And so that was always like kind of what drove me um, that and my teammates, um, you know, the other women that I was playing with, the guys that I was coaching, you know, it's really the people um, to me that makes things so special. It's who you're around. It's, um, you know, I say the thing I miss most about playing is the locker room. And that's, you know, that's the people, right? That's the people that you get to see every day. It's your friends, you know, you joke with, you work hard with, you, you know, you go grab food after, right? Like, um, and we, I call them all my football family. So um, for me, um, the tough times, it was all of them that really motivated me to, to keep going and to, to go harder. What is like, is there something that uh, annoyed you or still annoys you now being a, a female coach or a female football player? Um, probably lots of things. Um, I think, you know, I think one of the really annoying ones that we all as like women in sports get is like, oh my gosh, the social media. Oh my gosh, the people who don't have to put their name to comments and can just say crazy stuff. Um, because you hear it a lot and people, I, you know, I don't know how people have so much time to just be mean, right? But like, you know, I just don't have that much spare time. And if I'm going to, it's not gonna be to spend my extra time to be mean to somebody, right? But the one you always hear as like a football or like a female in sports is like, oh, go make me a sandwich. Or is she there to cook for the team? Or like go back to the kitchen, like, what are you even talking about, right? Like, why would you say that? And I don't know of any woman who's done big things in sports who hasn't gotten that kind of, she doesn't belong, like, or uh, she's just here as a publicity stunt. Um, because like when a woman is good at something that's traditionally male and she gets an opportunity, what do they say? Oh, it's a publicity stunt, right? Like. But why is that the narrative? And so I think things like that are really hard. Um, and yet, you know, one of the reasons why I'll talk about them is because I know that like when I was y'all's age, we didn't have to deal with um, some of the online bullying and the people on social media. And I can't even imagine how hard that would have been on me when I was younger, because it's still hard to me now, right? And one of the things that I've, um, that I tell people is be great and don't read the comments, right? Like just don't read them because, you know, it's not gonna help, right? And um, a lot of it's just the insecurity of somebody else who's looking at it or it's their own jealousy. It really has nothing to do with you. And so, um, and that's not just sports, right? That's all of us. And I think one of the things that you'll find is that people are, who are doing big things and great things, they don't have time for that. They're not gonna be the ones who are saying negative things to other people. So why listen to people who don't have your same level of aspiration? Um, I once read that um, female soccer players gets paid less 10 times less than male uh, soccer player and I was like in shock like 10 times less it was so sad you know it is really sad because you think of you know we talk about equal pay for equal work right and they say that on you know on the top end it's what 87 cents on the dollar that women make that men do and then there is no place 
um, where the disparity between men and women in terms of pay gap is greater than in sports, right? I remember, and I don't know what the new numbers are for the WNBA because they did just renegotiate and it is better, but it used to be um, up until maybe as recently as two years ago, because sorry, I'm forgetting time because COVID, I, you know, it feels like a bubble, right? Like it doesn't really feel like that could have been a whole year. Um, but it used to be that the WNBA salary cap was $110,000. And the women had to be six years vested to get that 110. Now, the league minimum in the NBA is way above $110,000. So there's really no place in our society where the disparity in pay is greater than in sports. And that's something that a lot of us that are in sports really advocate to change because, you know, why shouldn't girls who want to play sports have the opportunity to, you know, really do well for themselves financially as well, right? And that's why a lot of NBA players go overseas to, or WNBA players go overseas to play too, because they can make more money with overseas teams than they can in the States. Um, what, what AR and Jen was saying about like the the like differentiation between like the salaries, um, it just reminded me of like a previous post where I think it was something like um, in comparison to like the LA uh, Lakers team for the women in comparison to LeBron James's salary. I just remembered that when they were talking about it. Yeah, it was probably their entire team wasn't even close to his salary. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I think the other thing too, and I want to go back just a second to what you had mentioned about, you know, women and, uh, and, you know, they should be making sandwiches and things like that. Or the other big thing is, oh, they're just filling a quota. You know, that's, that's the other one. Oh, well, they have to because they need to have that equity. And, um, you know, really, it's, it's, you know, God forbid it actually be merit, but like you said, and, and that's, which is a really good lesson for, for all of you is there's always going to be those haters, those ignorant people that just because they couldn't do it or they aren't happy with themselves are going to say negative things. And, you know, you just have to, you just have to ignore it because they're always going to be there and you don't need to take your energy and, and put it on them. So for sure. Surround yourself with people who celebrate your successes, right? Who really want to see you win or who will help you get there, right? Like, oh, you want to do that? Well, let's go practice together, right? Let's go, you know, let's go pass the soccer ball or let's throw the football. Let's, you know, let's go do this together that, you know, we're going to be better because we did it as opposed to just finding things to be um, upset about or negative about. Right. And that's that's kind of what I try to do if if, you know, and and it's hard because when you do big things, people will be jealous. Right. And that's the hard thing. And some of them are even people that you would have thought would be good friends. Um, and what I've had to learn is that, you know, you evolve in life and the people around you kind of have to evolve with you, too. And that's OK. Right. It's OK to make decisions that um, will help you set yourself up for success. Um, I just had another question. Why did she, um, was it a choice for you or um, did you want to play with the men? So it was, I had played with women for a long time and the team, the Texas Revolution actually asked me if I would go out for, with the guys. And, um, it was, it was one of those things where they really, at the time when they asked me, they really did want it for publicity. Um, and they wanted me to go through one day of training camp with the guys. And I wasn't okay with that. Um, I, I had done too much in football to let somebody use me as a publicity son. So I said, if you want to do anything with me and your football team, either I do everything that the guys do or I do nothing. 
And, um, and at that point, the head coach was impressed. Um, he was not so happy up until that point because um, he wasn't happy about an idea of a publicity stunt. Um, but once I said that, he got on board. And so um, it was it was an important lesson in, you know, who you want to be in the world, right? Like I wasn't going to let them use me, but um, I did end up making it into a bigger opportunity than it would have if I would have just let them, you know, have me come out there and run around and take some pictures. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was definitely not something I set out to do. Um, but once, once the situation was there, I really didn't see how I could, you know, do it any other way. Um, I've wanted to ask a question, and maybe it's a bit out of context, but um, in the basketball, we had um, Kobe, who was very supportive of the women. Did uh, Does the NFL have such like um, a no-male figure like that supports the women? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't think to the extent that Kobe did. Um, however, I did a camp with Matt Leiner, um, <clears throat> maybe two, two weekends ago. And Matt Leiner is a former NFL quarterback and he wants to help with girls in football. So he kind of found out about it and has a daughter and was inspired by Kobe and what he did in basketball. And that's what made him want to start to get involved with the girls. So um, we are going to be working together, um, especially in California, to create opportunities for girls in football. And um, one of the things that I've found is that when those guys get around it, they really do like it, but a lot of them didn't know to get around it um, and to see the girls play. And I think you're just gonna see more and more guys who do start to advocate. And, um, you know, I, I had um, another guy the weekend before that in, um, in New Jersey when I was launching um, Girls Flag Football out there, his name is Jonathan Casillas, and he played in the NFL, I think, for maybe nine years. And he came out to, you know, support the girls. And he brought his daughter. And his daughter was nine. Um, and she wasn't gonna, she wasn't gonna play originally because it was for high school girls. But one of the things I had done is invited some of the girls that I'd worked with before who were get this, nine years old, although I didn't know his daughter was gonna be nine at the time, to come out and see that there was gonna be a future for them because it, you know, before that it wasn't possible for them to play high school flag football. And for the girls who were getting the opportunity to play, um, to see some of the girls that they were then becoming mentors to. So what happened is I took his daughter and I introduced her to those girls and then she wanted to play. And so then he got to see his daughter play and he was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So sometimes it really just takes the, getting the opportunity to see what something can be like in order to, you know, to change your mindset. Because obviously it was Kobe's relationship with Gigi that really made him want to move that needle for the girls in basketball. And I think that's what we need to see for girls in football as well. Um, have you, like, haven't you noticed, for example, let's say in my country, Jordan, um, NFL is like something that you, you never see. You can never see, like, it's just like something you play with your dad at the park. You can never see some training camps or anything, anything related to NFL. Hmm. So does like for but on the other hand like basketball and football they're like way way um into into the sport like in Jordan why why especially NFL I guess like it hasn't had um that much fame such as basketball and football and like for example us as uh, I don't I I've um I've got interested into NFL like um like three months ago something like that and then all you, before all of that all all you know about nfl just tony robbins that's all you know about nfl so why is tom that? brady tom brady tom brady 
I was like, Tony Robbins, is he in football too? I know, I was like, wait, a motivation <laughs> speaker, he's everywhere. Uh, Tom oh, you're Brady. fine. So that was all you'd heard over there is Tom Brady? Yeah, I mean, in Jordan, like, I'm, I'm a person that plays so many sports, but, like, NFL was never, I just played with my dad at the park, you know? I never just, uh, I never, I've never seen any camp in Jordan for NFL, not even for men, not only for women, not even for men. It's not, like, sport that is not available in Jordan. Hmm. It's interesting. Um, well, it makes me want to change it, number one. Um, but I, I think that is one of the challenges um, is that it has been a, a very American sport and it's really an expensive sport to adopt because of all of the equipment that's required. I know I went over to um, Australia and um, I coached the Australian women's national team. And the first time I went over to Australia, um, I get a call like the day before I'm leaving. And my friend was like, hey, can you just pop to the store and grab us some down and distance markers? We can't get them here. And I was like, where does one even buy down and distance markers? Like, it's not like they grow on trees here, but people think that because it's American football, it must be everywhere, right? Like you could just get it at the street corner. Um, but they couldn't get the equipment in Australia. So I ended up finding it. And if you don't know what down and distance markers are, they're the big orange pillars that you move down the football field as you, you know, as you gain. So they're giant. So I'm going through the airport with like these giant boxes to be able to get them to Australia, but they couldn't get the resources, even though they were playing and even, um, even the equipment, right? Like pads and helmets. So, you know, in practice, practice jerseys are really loose. They're really big. Um, whereas you see the game jerseys are really fitted. So I had worked with the Australian women's team and until we were in Canada and they had to try on their fitted jerseys, I didn't realize that their pads did not fit them. They were ginormous because most of the women who decided they wanted to play had just gotten hand-me-downs from guys that they knew who played. So when I say that these pads really didn't fit, I mean, they were giant. Thankfully, we could get them more pads in Canada because it's, you know, there's a lot more there. But I think the, the fact that the equipment is hard to get and that it's very expensive has made the sport less, less global than some of the other sports. Um, and I think what you're going to see is that there will be a lot more opportunities in flag football because flag is so much less expensive. You can go out and just play with a football like you could a pickup basketball game or a pickup soccer game. Um, whereas, you know, American football with all that equipment, you really can't do. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges internationally is the expense and the complexity. Because even in Australia, when we went there, um, most of their coaches didn't have access to great coaching. They were trying to teach themselves off of like YouTube. And that was part of the reason why me and some of the guys that I knew went over there to you know, help um, grow the game and to help even coach the coaches. So it's a lot of knowledge and expense, I think. I was going to say the same thing. It's probably the expense uh, as well because it's, you know, it, it is an expensive sport. So, so I have a friend. Uh, we've been friends for a long time now, but she's currently in Japan because of COVID and she had to go back and stuff like that. Um, and she does, um, but it's like just like running distances and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and her whole team is made out of, uh, made up of women and her coach is a man and this is actually a conversation she had last afternoon with her team and she told me about it and I was like so because she's in Japan and uh, Japan is an overly misogynistic and everything women do I mean a lot of countries are like this but I'm just saying uh, overly everything women do will rather be athletic stuff uh, things polit political whatever is always um, underrated kind of just not looked at so she was talking to her friends about 
what do y'all want to do once you're, you know, out of school? Is there anything you'd want to reach in life? Because they're all pretty clear. They're 18, 17, around that age. So everyone was like, yeah, I would like to, you know, go to whatever or whatever. And so uh, John was like, I'd like to go to Canada and live there and be a coach. And, uh, and then she told me that her teacher, man, was like, but that's not what women are supposed to do. That's not your purpose in life. You should go to Europe. They're just, they just stay in the kitchen and cook for their husbands. And that's the right thing to do. And she was just like, and so everyone got really mad at him, but they said not to argue. Cause, you know. And uh, so she talked to her mom about it. And her mom was just like, don't listen to the coach. You know, unfortunately, um, I, I am not surprised that she faced that conversation. And I'm going to tell you that everyone on here, you're going to have people who tell you things that aren't right. And it's up to you what you do about them, right? Like, and they, they have their opinions and you have your life and you're not living your life for their opinion. Um, and so really surround yourself by people who don't, that aren't as confined by those stereotypes, right? Like um, on capability or humanity. I mean, I have, from being in football, I say my football family is the most beautifully diverse family you could ever imagine, right? It's women and men who we've played together, we've played against each other, we've coached together, been coached by them, they've coached me. And we are every make, model, shape, size, creed, color, sexual orientation, socioeconomic background, you know, that's what we are. And that's what's amazing in my life, right? It's given me this rich tapestry of people who I love and we got to know each other through a shared love of a game. And one where you want the very best people out on the field with you. If you can ball, I want you, right? And then I get the opportunity to even know you better right? Like, are we going over to each other's houses and I get to try food that I, you know, maybe wouldn't have tried before. And, you know, um, or do I get to learn about a holiday that I wouldn't have known of otherwise? And to me, those are really um, the beautiful moments in life. And um, it's sad that some people uh, have never had the opportunity to get better in terms of wanting to know and understand other people. That's the best that I can say. And, and, you know, unfortunately, or, you know, whatever it is, it's their loss that that's all they see people as capable of. It's their loss because they're missing out on some really cool folks. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, well, I've got to say a confession before, before we continue. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, well, so, um, uh, maybe most of you know I have um, I played basketball, football, soccer, which is soccer, like, um, and I play taekwondo. So, and I've always, always hated um, to have a female coach, just because um, they used to be, you know, um, too soft with you. Like they were like, when I, whatever you do, they just clap for you, and then you're doing great. Until I had a basketball coach. Her name was Coach Vivian. And she changed the whole perspective. Actually, because of her, I've got to learn basketball the way I play. So maybe probably like just because um, men are, are usually tough on you, like they tell you you're doing wrong, you're doing this wrong and this wrong. And like many female coaches, they were just like, you know, you're doing wrong and you just want them to learn you. But they just say, oh, well, no, you as a girl, what you're doing is perfect for now. Mm-hmm. As a girl, that's enough. And so until that coach came and changed the whole perspective of like female coaching in general. Uh, About like two years ago or three years ago, there were like young female in Egypt, female soccer players. They were like 15, 16 uh, and they were playing a, a game and they won. And the media was like posting about them that they won. And like, I just got into the, the comments and like there are were tons of comments over saying oh now take your shirt off like you just uh, scored a goal and go make me a sandwich and stuff like there are li- really very very mean people who are sick and like I think this thing uh, need to be like illegal like for now it's getting way better than before 
but we're still learning like mm -hmm. i believe at some point it will get we will get to have equal payments as well mm -hmm. in sports in general and you have to remember a lot of it is ignorance and a lot of it is how people were raised you know and so doing these types of things having these conversations not getting angry but teaching them that there is something different out there that the world is changing and educating them in the sense that it's it's not, you know, years ago anymore is the best thing that, that you can do uh, in response to something like that. So Dr. Jen, any final words for, for them? Um, yeah, I mean, the thing that I would say is that um, we have to look at the world and think of the world as we want it to be, not the way it's been, right? And if we all work towards that, right? Being, um, being more understanding, being more compassionate, being more inclusive, being more fair, um, then we can all be a part of the solution. There are always going to be people who don't get it, um, but we can't give them too much of our energy, right? Of our heart space and head space. It doesn't mean when you see it, it doesn't hurt sometimes, right? Like I'm practiced at it. I've been you know, in the spotlight many times, which means you've been a target many times. And yet it doesn't, and yet doesn't mean you don't feel it, right? But the good thing is that when we surround ourselves with a really good tribe, we can remind each other, like, don't listen to them. They're not right. Or, hey, okay, maybe it was that way, but that's not the way it has to be in the future. And just continue to try and find great people who are doing great things and, you know, to try and be better all together than we would be apart. 